Good morning. Welcome, everyone. My name is Beth Capellis, and I'm the marketing manager here at Triangle Microworks. I'd like to welcome everyone to our latest webinar, Simplifying Secure, Routable Goose and Sample Values. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The webinar is scheduled to be one hour long. We typically get a large amount of questions, so we're happy to stay on longer to answer as many questions as possible. With that said, I'd like to encourage questions throughout the webinar. Since the audience is on mute, please go ahead and submit your questions using the webinar menu under the section titled questions. You can start asking questions as soon as you have them. Go ahead and just start typing them in. Do not feel like you have to wait to the end. We'll actually begin answering those questions online as we have several engineers monitoring the questions and responding to them directly. And again, we will have some time in the end to go over questions and answers. With that said, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. First, we have Herb Falk from PCI Tech. Herb has over 40 years experience and has been involved with the 61850 technology since 1982 and cybersecurity since 1993. He's an editor of IEC 61850 8-1 editor of several cybersecurity standards, and is the vice president of testing for the UCA International User Group. Second, uh, we have uh, our second speaker today is Mark Adamiak. Mark is an independent consultant for the electric power industry with previous employment at American Electric Power and GE. Mark is an original member of the 62050 Working Group, a life fellow of IEEE, a registered professional engineer in the state of Ohio and a GE Edison Award winner. And last but certainly not least, we have Joel Green from Triangle Microworks. Joel has worked with communication protocols for over 20 years with the last six years in the power industry. He's the lead engineer for 61850 development and products at Triangle Microworks and is heavily involved with 61850 industry groups. He also works as the co-editor of IEC 61850-7-2. He is a member of the UCA Test Committee and Test Procedures Working Group and involved in the IEEE Standard Association. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to Herb to get started. Thank you, Beth. We're gonna discuss today the need for security, how the 61850 Routable Goose and Routable Sample Value uh, Security Paradigm brings resiliency to security and operational technologies. We're going to discuss uh, the need for simulating the impact of security on your system, and we're going to introduce a key distribution center and show how you can configure security in five minutes, and then we're going to have some questions. So I will turn this over to Mark Adamiak. Thank you, Herb, and good morning, everybody. So to start off, why multicast and security? The industry uses a, te a technique called use cases. A use case identifies a potential application and how it can best be served, in this case, by communication mechanisms. Uh, there are many use cases that went into the development of the Radable Goose as well as Radable Sample Values, but we're going to just start here on a detailed focus on one, which is transfer tripping. There are many, many lines around the country where you have, a, a say, a medium voltage line or a sub-transmission line, in this case 69 kV, where a number of transformers are tapped off of the 69 kV line. There is a region or a zone of protection that is not visible by the protection at the 69 kV bus. And in particular, this is the region between the transformer and in this case here, a 13 kV circuit breaker. Faults in this region are not visible to any protection at 69 kV. One solution that's been in place for many years now 
is implementation of what is known as a ground switch. The ground switch, as shown in the figure here, you can see multiple ground switches, is op when a fault is detected in this region, the relay sends a signal to the ground switch, which operates it and forms a ground fault. So, Herb, next slide. So in, in this case here, the ground, uh, give me one more click, Herb. When the fault comes on, the relay operates, next click. The relay sends a trip and operate signal, a trip to the breaker and an operate signal to the ground switch. The ground switch literally places a ground fault on the 69 kV system Give me, a, give me a click, Herb. And when that ground is made, now the 69 kV protection can see that fault. And one more click. And in that case, when it sees the protection, it can then operate. So there are two significant drawbacks to this technique. The first one is it's not really the best idea to put a fault on your system, to clear a fault. And as the system continues to get stronger, the ground faults become larger and larger. And this pre presents another problem then because the uh, higher current ground switches are more difficult to find and or maybe not even available depending upon the voltage at which the ground fault occurs. So this, this presents itself as a what we call a use case for transfer tripping. Next slide, Herb. In this case now, we have a similar scenario, but instead at each relay location, we have a device that can be connected to the existing relays and upon re and, and then the relay can see uh, when, uh, when, well, when, when the relay picks up, a message is sent to the relay. And Herb, let me one more click. Well, so again, the fault comes on. When the fault comes on, one more click. The relay, seeing the fault, sends out a routable goose messages. This is a multicast or unicast. Both are supported, and. It's instead of putting a ground fault on, it sends a transfer trip message. This message would typically go over the utility communication network, but if secured, it allows any communication network to be used uh, for the communication purposes. So our, our goose, as, we, as, you, uh, as you may or may not be aware, contains security mechanisms to prevent a wide range of potential uh, attacks, and Herb will go into detail on those. Another very interesting aspect, now to do this, to secure the message, a key is needed, and the, the main focus of the rest of the seminar will be on how the key is distributed from what is called a key distribution center, or KDC, to all of the relays involved in the transfer trip mechanism. And one of the things that's gonna come up during the discussion is the concept of what if communications are lost to the devices? Uh, there is something called key, a KDA, which Herb will go into detail on. Herb, take it away. Oh no, one more, one more slide, one more slide. Now, this was just one use case. Several other use cases have been identified for application of uh, the Routable Goose, specifically remedial action schemes. And the, uh, route, the R Goose is actually in place right now uh, on a remedial action system. Synchrophaser data transmission, which is known as Routable Sample Values, is actually in service as we speak right now. Microgrid control, since this since the Rattable Goose can hit hundreds or even thousands of devices simultaneously, the 
configuration of a microgrid can be easily, uh, easily and securely affected with the secure rattable goose. Surgical load shed. Many remedial action schemes today, when called upon, will strip the enti an entire feeder. But if you look at household load, being able to dynamically trip, say, an air conditioner, a pool pump, a dishwasher, a dryer, this would be called surgical load shed, and it could be affected, uh, effectively removing a significant part of the load without affecting day-to-day -day life. The new technology is coming out now in the concept of grid forming and black start, specifically using inverter-based devices. Inverter-based devices will, will require sequencing. So that means turn on this inverter first, then this inverter, then this inverter, and to, to bring the grid up from black start. Rattable Goose is a perfect mechanism for performing this function. Okay, Herb, now it's your turn. Oper <clears throat> Excuse me, frog in the throat. Operational people uh, typically look at security with some degree of apprehension, uh, especially in regards to their focus versus IT's focus on threats. What you see on the left-hand side is the operational technology uh, prior typical priority of the list of threats that need to be countered, which is people tampering with the packets, uh, hackers uh, injecting uh, uh, packets that aren't supposed to be there, which is spoof or replay, packets needing to be authenticated, and lowest on their totem pole is the need for information leakage protection and confidentiality. As Mark uh, talked about, routable goose, routable sample values, and even the layer two goose and sample values have been updated to support security that counter these threats based upon messaging uh, authentication codes, uh, public key infrastructure certificates, and the distribution of common keys for signing and for encryption. For those of you who don't know what a key is, it's a big number and it's generated with what is called cipher randomness. The theory is they do not repeat. There are two forms of uh, encryption that are in typical use today. One is asymmetric and the other is symmetric encryption. In asymmetric encryption, the owner of, of the key pair has a public key that it gives to the publisher and a private key that when the publisher encrypts with the public key, only the holder of the private key can decrypt it. This works for peer-to-peer -peer client server relationships, but as you can see in the top part of this diagram, the uh, inability of the second node here to decrypt the uh, published message is a problem with multicast and it cannot decrypt the pub published message because it does not hold the private key and private keys should never be distributed to other uh, non-owning nodes. There's another technology called symmetric encryption where there's a group key that is managed which is distributed to all the members of the publication group. The publisher publishes and encrypts the value using the group key. Any member that's been provided the group key can now decrypt that message. So this is the mechanism that's used by Rattable Goose, Rattable Sample Values, and the 61850 multicast security. One of the other issues that operational people typically have is what happens if I lose security? Uh, the 61850 multicast security 
starts addressing this resiliency issue by delivering two sets of policies and keys in one distribution. And the policy uh, specifies how much longer the key provided is valid for, the encryption algorithm to be used using that key, the authentication mechanism, in other words, the signature or the MAC algorithm, and an activation delay. The activation delay allows for an overlap between the current and the next policy and keys to actually overlap. So if there's been a group member that hasn't quite gotten the notice of the second uh, key pair, uh, it can still operate for a while. The next thing that's been added uh, to really improve resiliency, as Mark talked about, is key delivery assurance. It's the responsibility of the key distribution center to track the percentage of group members that have acknowledged the key delivery. Once a certain percentage level is reached, it can tell the publisher that when it is time to rotate to the next key, the group is ready to use those keys based upon that percentage. It is noteworthy uh, that it's almost impossible to reach 100% uh, members of a group being updated with the new keys in an operational uh, environment. And the reasons for this can be uh, several, but think of an IED being offline or uh, decommissioned for testing or some other reason. Do you, it's up to the system design and the security people to determine if that was the case, is it still okay to rotate the keys? And therefore, the system design and resiliency needs needs to be weighted against the percentage of key delivery. There are two forms of key delivery uh, allowed. One is group pull and one is group push. In the pull situation, the KDC responds to key requests from the group members. In the push mechanism, the KDC actually pushes the keys out to the group members. Obviously, the asynchronous process of the group pool makes it difficult for the publisher to receive the KDA and therefore uh, push is the preferred mechanism if you are using key delivery assurance. There's another part of resiliency is that when group members power up, they are responsible for pulling, pulling the keys from the KDC for the groups they are interested in. This allows them to resync with the current and next keys immediately upon power up. If there is a push that the group member cannot decode uh, because it doesn't have the correct encryption keys decryption keys to decrypt the push, it needs to pull in order to resync. This mechanism is very important because it allows the KDC to revoke members based upon revoked PKI certificates. This is a look at a very high level of the layer two and routable security wrappers for multi IEC 61850 multicast security. It is possible to secure layer two goose as and additionally routable goose. So the routable goose is a primary concern because of NERC SIP requirements and the fact that it is typically used to go outside of an electronic security perimeter. It is not recommended to encrypt layer two sample values 
for security just because of the uh, CPU needed and the high bandwidth uh, that would be uh, required there. So you can see that um, the policy determines if the payload, which is the goose and the sample value uh, packets are encrypted. And for layer two goose, it determines if there's a signature or a message authentication code. In the routable scenario, message authentication codes are required and encryption is optional. So at this point, I think we will break and ask, are there any questions on this section? Um, we do have um, uh, several questions that have come in. So let me uh, just pick a couple of them and I'll put them out to you know all the speakers. Any one of you can feel free to answer them. Um, so the first one is, please describe the logical nodes that contains the distributed keys in other security management settings. So there are a couple of places to look for that. The keys are never exposed in the logical nodes, but the fact that there's a key delivery issue would be indicated in the supervision function of goose or sample values, which would be the algos or sample value. Uh, also, there's a generic security logical node that could be a place to indicate a key failure as well as there are there is a logging mechanism to put those type of events into. Okay. Irv, I would add, add one more feature, and that is that the policy of what, in, what encryption algorithms actually comes from the KDC. Well, I guess you're going to get into that, but uh, but it's relevant here. Okay, next question we have. In what way is synchrophaser data different than 61850? Wow, um, that, that could take months to describe, <laughs> but Mark, I'll let you do it. All right, so synchro so data is data. 61850 carries data. Most recently, uh, in the standard now, it's been identified that synchrophaser data, uh, of course, has a time sync on it that is that it, that has to be compliant with the IEEE C37.118 standard, which is the synchrophaser standard. It defines time, the uh, time synchronization requirements as well as the timestamp requirements. 61850 has been augmented to include all of this information. There is a new uh, logical node that is a synchro logical node. So when the device is configured, the synchro logical node identifies the fact that the data in this node is synchronized per C37.118. Subsequently, the since synchrophasers are synchronous, similar to sample values, the profile R routable uh, sample values, R-SV was created such that it maintains the synchronous transmission like sample values, uh, but instead of having samples in it, it would have synchrophasers mapped into it as complex values. I just have one more thing to add to it. C37.118 has two parts to it. One is part one, that is the measurement technique to generate synchrophasers. Part two is a templatized packet format that can run over various transports that are used to deliver that measured information. 61850 in the routable sample values can define what's called a data set to transfer the synchronized measured data just as if it was normal data in a secure and standardized fashion. Okay, 
All right, guys, thanks for that very detailed answer. Um, I would say at this point, we do still have a lot of questions coming in. Keep the questions coming, we will get to them, but to make sure we can get through uh, the presentation, Herb, why don't you pick it back up? Actually, this is Joel that needs to pick oh, it up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. Here's thanks, Herb, Beth. Good day, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm Joel Triangle, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how to test these systems. As Herb mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, um, OT and IT staffs in, in the utility industry are inherently in a, in a state of conflict. They have different goals in their job descriptions, um, and security tends to land straight in the middle of, of that conflict uh, quite often. Security has a history and a reputation of causing trouble, confusion, and fear, especially in this industry where keeping the lights on is absolutely the goal for the whole organization. Now, while security is, is in conflict with some of those goals in the short term, it's becoming more and more clear that long term, reducing the risk of cyber attacks and, and unauthorized uh, access is, is necessary to those goals, of keeping the lights on. So this leads us to a couple of needs in, in the process of securing these systems. As engineers implementing security in the communications here, we need to test these systems. We need to be able to uh, show that they work and understand how they fail and what the, what the failure modes and results are when, when there are problems with the security. Um, so we've got a couple of tools here to help with that. We also have a further goal to try to help out with some of that conflict we mentioned with the with the OT and IT staff and, and other stakeholders. We need to be able to demonstrate to those other concerned folks that this system is working, it is reliable, and it will help increase the reliability of the network. So the first tool we're gonna to look at here for a minute is the uh, DTM product from Triangle Microworks. It's a 61850 system simulator. Um, it lets us bring up and simulate all the devices in a configured substation. As you can see there in the middle, we have a single line diagram showing the various components of the system and how they interact. And we can bring that up and we can uh, have those devices simulating what the substation will do in normal operations, prove that that works, and then we can start injecting faults and analyze how the system reacts. This is particularly useful in analyzing what happens with the security concerns. Uh, for instance, if the uh, devices in the field can't get the keys that we're talking about here today from the KDC, that's gonna result in it not getting the information it needs from other devices. That information it's getting from other devices are inputs to logical nodes in, in the subscribing device. So therefore it can't make the same decisions. The outputs of that device then can get affected because of not being able to get the inputs he needs, and you can get a potential cascade failure. And we need to be able to, to observe that and, and show what it looks like when, when those cases happen. And also, as I said, um, demonstrate that to other stakeholders to build confidence in these systems. So on the right-hand side here, we've got a status indicator and the red lights and green lights simply tell us from the subscriber side for each device if I'm getting each of those goose streams that I need. So being able to set this up, simulate the whole system, shows us that um, we can demonstrate how the system will react in all these failure modes. In order to further analyze what's going on in the system, on the next slide here, we've got a diagnostic tool that we provide, Test Suite Pro. 61850 servers, subscriber servers, um, are able to implement a functionality, a logical node called LGOS, which lets the server indicate the status of the Goose subscriptions it has. So this matrix here is showing us for each subscriber, publisher, pair, what the subscriber is seeing about it. So the, the purple boxes here um, are telling us that we don't can't read the LGOS right now, but generally those will be green when everything's happening. The red boxes are telling us that we're not getting the signals we want. And so we can quickly analyze from a third party perspective, whether against the DTM simulator or later as we've proven the system and gotten into the substation against the real devices, we 
can quickly monitor here and see what those subscribers are, are, are doing, whether they're getting the signals they receive or not. If we back up a step the next slide, we've also got a goose tracker here. This is not looking at the servers, but just looking at the streams on the wire and comparing that to the SCD file, the system configuration description from 61850 tells us what goose messages should be available in the network. And this tracker looks on the wire and shows us what's on the wire, how it compares to the streams we expect from the configuration file. We can integrate here with the keys. We can get the keys from the KVC so that we can decode those messages, validate that the security on those messages is correct and show all of the necessary information to prove the system out. So that's very helpful in, as I said, diagnosing the system, proving that the system works and demonstrating those to other stakeholders. Or any, any questions on that? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions come in specific to the tools, but I will go back just to uh, cover some of the earlier questions that were asked so we can get to some of them. Um, and again, this is open to all the speakers. How do devices get their initial certs? Are these provided by the manufacturer? Um, in an operational environment, those certs should be provided by the utility, not by the manufacturer. And they should come from a PKI infrastructure a certificate authority or a regional authority that the utility trust or operates itself. Okay, next question. Which part of the IEC 62050 do I need to look at to understand and learn Argus and RSV? Um, the, there was an old technical report called 61850 90-5 that has all the use cases and some out-of-date technology in it plus informative text but the new routable uh, protocol is actually defined in 61850-8-1 and the security is defined for layer 2 goose in 61850 no, sorry, 62351-6. And we're going to get into some of that uh, coming up here. Okay. Um, can we simulate and view the data associated with IEDs without a physical component? I assume by physical component, you mean the device itself. Um, I I believe we're referring to the, the DTM simulator here. The DTM is a is a Windows app that runs on a, um, a fairly average PC to simulate those devices. Okay. How does the Goose Tracker account for MAC address filtering on the switch? That is in part of the SCD file. Uh, it does not. The Goose Tracker shows what, what it can see on the connection that it's plugged into, of course. You can get into using things like mirror ports and that to expand that, but but yes, where you've got a situation where you've got Mac filtering in the network um, or potentially VLANs can, can restrict traffic, um, you do have to manage to get the, the observation point of the, of the tracker at, at, at a place in the network the traffic's available. Okay. What are the differences between 61857-2 with that compared to 61859-5? Uh, I don't believe there is a 9-5, 90-5 or 9-2. I'm not sure which we're referring to there. It's got it coming in 9-5. Whoever submitted that question, if you want to send a clarifying, uh, no, 90-5 is what he's referring to. Okay, 90-5 was the technical report that laid out 
the uh, original implementation. And Herb, you can feel free to jump in anytime here. Herb was one of the authors of that paper or that TR um, that demonstrated the, the routable goose and sample values. Seven two is the abstract uh, services description for 61850. So it describes the concepts of multicast publisher subscriber information, but uh, 82 is the um, schism, the specific mapping to a protocol on the wire. Um, it provides the information for the layer two goose traditionally. And now with the amendment one of addition two, it is absorbed uh, the information that was in 90-5 with a few updates for the routable protocols. And I just want to add 90-5 theoretically no longer exist from a standards perspective. Right. I've seen um, requests for information and for proposals that actually specify 90-5. They need to specify and be upgraded to addition to amendment one. Of 8-1. Yes. Okay, with that, I would say we'll put the other questions um, on hold for now um, and address them a little bit later if you want to go, go ahead and get back into the presentation. Okay, one of the primary fears of both IT and OT people is how much effort does it take to configure and maintain security? So. At the tail end of this section, we're going to demonstrate how you can configure key distribution in under five minutes. And we're using a new product called Garibaldi. It's from PCI Tech and uh, Triangle Microworks has the rights to resell it. And we're going to concentrate today on the 61850 key management aspect because we're talking 61850 today. The concept in key distribution is the keys are delivered in what, over what's called a security management plane. And this delivery provides the policies and the keys we were talking about previously to group members uh, that are concerned about publishing and subscribing to particular data from a publication control block. The, those publication control blocks and the publication of that information is what's actually used in what's called the real-time plane and to trip as in Mark's use cases. 62351-9 is the specification that starts the chain of standards that defines the exchange mechanism and the management mechanisms that are actually implemented in Garibaldi. There was an RFC 8052 written that allows the delivery of two keys and two policies plus some other extensions to the normal group domain of interpretation which is an internet RFC, I believe it's 6407. So it's uh, very standards oriented. 62351-9 uh, introduces the concept of standardized key delivery assurance. There is a more clarity provided in how to do a group push to both unicast uh, destinations and multicast destination addresses for key delivery and it uses X509 digital certificates to authenticate group members to the KDC as well as the KDC uh, to authenticate itself to group members and I think that was one of the questions in uh, the question menu here. Um, Garibaldi took a step back away from manual configuration. And since it's 61850 component is 61850 centric, there was a decision made to leverage the power of the 61850 engineering process, which is 
the system configuration language. And the reason that decision was made is the system configuration description file contains the communication addresses of all of the IEDs in the system, the destination of the data that's being published, all the destination addresses for the goose and sample value publications, all the control blocks, and actually allows you to express who are the subscribers for each publication control block. When you bring in the SCD that we're using for the demo into the Helinx tool, it can actually show the network topology of the system. And this is based upon 61850 subnet information. This is an image from the Helinx substation toolset tool, STS. And you can actually see here the destination addresses for Routable Goose and Layer 2 Goose. And unfortunately, it's cut off, but you can see that the L92 IED is a subscriber for this Goose control block and Routable Goose. And you'll see a different representation of the same information in the GUI of Garibaldi. The way the uh, subscriptions are uh, defined is here in the SCD file is a goose control block. These rows that contain IED names actually reference the names of the IED, other IEDs in the SCD file, and these are the subscribers for the data that's being published by this control block. In order to configure efficiently, global policies need to be decided upon, such as what type of certificate validation is going to be used to authenticate group members, what the encryption algorithm is, what the hash and signature algorithm it is, whether using group push, the percentage of KDA members that are required in order to give KDA to the publisher of a group, and the interval for key generation, in other words, the key rotation, and whether to use key delivery assurance or not. These global policies are enforced upon import of the SCL file. Garibaldi does allow you to change the individual policies per publication group, but if you can get close with the global policy, you shouldn't need to change the individual policies. So this is where you select group push or group pull. Uh, it's advised to use group push because KDA adds a new, uh, another protection for resiliency. Garibaldi was designed with two types of certificate validation. You can either validate with just certificate validation or you can match the IP address providing the certificate as being in the SCD file and the certificate being valid. This mechanism here allows for test equipment to be brought into the system become a member of a group as long as they have a recognized and validatable certificate, perform their testing, and then disappear from the group with no reconfiguration of the system required. If this is the mechanism used, well, they've got to, the IP address has to be well known and be basically be, be designed as part of the system. We support multiple, the standard specified encryption algorithms and hash map algorithms. Uh, the KDA percentage uh, specifies the percentage of group members that are required to acknowledge the keys prior to the publisher for that group being given 
the OK to rotate the keys, and the interval for generation is the rotation periodicity of the keys and the, pol and the policies. And typically it's 24 hours, but the default we provide is 12 hours. You can also in Garibaldi um, define your own username and passwords. It is not provided with a default password. Uh, we use a multi-factor uh, attribute certificate that's provided with Garibaldi for the initial login. These are the standard roles from 62351-8 versus their rights as they apply to Garibaldi. You can define custom roles. You cannot define custom rights. In order to validate certificates from group members, the certificate authority or regional authority public certificates need to be loaded into Garibaldi. This is used as a first uh, level of validating that it's a trusted certificate. Of course, revocation list and checking real time will also be available. In order to allow Garibaldi to negotiate the secure channel, to deliver the group pool keys, and uh, the group pool of keys, and to allow the group members to validate the KDC, you must also have upload an identity certificate for the KDC into the KDC. So what are we going to see in the demo? We're going to see the login. We're going to see the configuration of database credentials. Uh, we're going to create some username and passwords as well as uh, defining a uh, demo log user login. We're, for the system that's in the lab we're going to be talking to, we need, actually need two certificate authority certificates loaded. We're going to import the identity certificate for the KDC. We're going to import the global policy and then import the SCL. And this, if you uh, gather all of your information and plan ahead, this is definitely achievable in under five minutes, but it requires planning. So what to expect? Our starting point is that the GE UR relays in the lab have expired keys. When we uh, finish the configuration and one to two minutes later, we would expect that the GEs actually ha show that they have received their keys and are communicating. At the end point, we would expect, and this is a Garibaldi display, that we would see that an IED has, which is the publishing IED here, has been delivered its key and all the group members, and there's only one in this group, have been delivered the required keys. So basically, we've met 100% KDA and the IED has been told it's okay to rotate the keys for this particular publication group. There is a column here called KDA fail. Garibaldi's designed to assume that the first push out of the keys probably won't reach and be acknowledged by 100% of the group members and therefore Garibaldi continues to retry to deliver the keys. If the key delivery fails on three retries, Garibaldi continues to retry, but it'll let, uh, it'll enunciate a true here that there have been three attempts to deliver keys to non-acknowledging uh, group members and you can see the yellow light here. 
And in more detail, you can see this is false and that is false as well. And 0% of uh, the members were delivered the key. Any questions? So we do have a lot of questions coming in. We're getting a little tight on time. Um, so I'm going to maybe address one or two questions, Herb, and then we can wrap up and then address the rest of the time for all the questions. Okay. Um, okay, so one of the questions that just came in, can I have a redundant hot standby on, our, on KDC as well as we have domain controller certificate authorities? Yes, and the design of Garibaldi is uh, for uh, redundant paths to the CAs as well. Redundancy okay. is not available in the demo version that'll be available for download though. Okay. If KDC is out for more time for, and I'm just trying to read it as it's coming in. If KDC is out for more than time period of two keys, including rotating key, what happens to the system? In the um, new 62351-9, it's going to be specified that there should be a configuration item in the group members to continue operation with the last delivered key and policy. Okay, and last question before we go back to the presentation. Is KDC an IED communication through PKI? No, it utilizes PKI certificates, but it use, uses uh, Diffie-Hellman and some secure channel um, creation for GDOI to actually deliver the keys. Okay. So we still got questions coming in and answering them online. Um, if you want to, we can wrap up the end of the presentation, Herb, and then we can address the questions. Well, we have the demo still yep. coming. Okay. So what's going on in the demo? I am sitting here in Troy, Michigan, and the lab I'm communicating with is in Gainesville, uh, Texas. I almost said Florida. So we're gonna go into the demo now. Just to show you, this is a remote desktop session to a computer down in the uh, test lab. And you can see all of the keys and the URs have expired. There is Garibaldi does not have a GUI except for a web-based GUI. So th this is not an RDP connection. This is a connection over the internet to the KDC uh, in the lab. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna log in with our two-factor authentication attribute certificate. We're going to configure the database that we are going to connect to and what the mechanism for authentication is. And this is SQL Server. We test the connection, we save the connection, and now we can go in and configure some information regarding the demo and the location. And we're going to call this SNARK1 just to be consistent. and save it. Now we're gonna go into security and define a new login. So we don't have to use the attribute certificate any longer. And I'm just gonna give myself all rights. Obviously you would wanna pre-plan what the username and passwords versus roles would be. Now we're gonna go in 
and load our certificate authority information. And remember, we need two for this lab. Then we go in and we actually load the identity certificate for the KDC. <clears throat> now we can go into the global policy and we'll set this to 15 minutes. We'll set this to 50%. We will set this to group push. We will set this to what the relays support and we will turn on KDA. Now at this point, we should be ready to import the SCD file, which describes the system as you saw in the previous slide. These filters down here specify which type of control blocks this particular instance of the KDC is gonna manage. So we are going to go in and submit it. And you can see it's upload, it was uploading, it is uploading. And now we are 100% configured in, in two minutes. The KDC will start trying to deliver keys. And just so you can see, this control block um, uh, is not being managed. This control block is being managed and we haven't delivered any keys yet. There are also some other nice menus, which are system status menus. Tells you how long the uh, uh, KDC has been up, how many data streams are actually in use versus the license. The demo license allows you to do eight data streams and I'll show you where you can see that. Tells you the number of local username and passwords configured, the normal of active sessions. So somebody else has logged in to this particular uh, instance of Garibaldi. How many uh, security associations are actually in place? So somebody is actively trying to pull keys at this point in time. We don't disclose who that is. If you want to see your license information, this is it. Demo licenses expire in 30 days. There's also a logging menu. So if you ever see a non-green LED, this is where to come. And the last 30 logged messages are shown here. And you can download your log files when you're remote. And let's see here. Let's go back and see if somebody has keys. And you can see the L90-3 has delivered key has delivered the key, received its key for this, and the T60. Uh, no response I IED has received its key. Now let's see if the L90, the L90 has received its keys. 
And if the T60 has received its keys, we're all good. And now if we go back and refresh these screens, you now see uh, that they have been delivered their keys and they are actively communicating with each other via Rattable Goose. And I think it's time to go back to the slideshow. So in conclusion, uh, Goose and sample value security is real and can be managed because there's a KDC available for it now. I hope you all find that the use of SCL to configure the security really minimizes the effort in configuring security. Uh, testing and monitoring tools are available and it's time to start planning how you can benefit from this combination. I think, Beth, this is your slide. So that does bring us to the end of the actual presentation and demo. So what we're um, gonna do here is open it up to a question and answer. Um, but before we do that, I just wanna let everyone know the webinar will be posted um, at our website at trianglemicroworks.com. Um, it will be on the homepage there. Uh, you will also get a follow-up email um, right after you sign off of the, the webinar with a link to a recorded version of this webinar. Um, you'll also get a quick survey. It's only about five questions. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, your get your feedback on the webinar itself and what information that you'd like to receive. Um, if you do respond to the survey, we will send you this presentation as well as the full question and answer spreadsheet. We got um, quite a few questions coming in today, so I think it'd be a great piece of information. So please respond to that survey. Um, and then certainly feel free to email sales at trianglemicroworks.com for any questions that you have or anything else we can help with. Um, or, to, or, to or to request a download of a demonstration version of the KDC. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we'd love to hear from you and stay tuned um, as we publish information about our next upcoming webinar, which we'll be scheduling sometime in August. So with that, anyone that wants to stay on, you know, we have run out of time, so I understand anyone that's got to jump off, but anyone that stays on, we will start to go through the, the question and answers. Um, so again, I'm going to open up the questions to all the speakers and anyone that is online with us uh, that's been answering questions behind the scenes. Um, so let me just take it from the top here. Like I said, we've got quite a few questions that come in and it looks like we've answered a lot of them online, which is great. Um, okay. What happens if an end device never gets a key? Will it not do its function? Um, if it's got to communicate with other devices that have received their keys, it won't be able to do that. But except for communication issues, it will be able to do its function. Okay. Not all IEDs on the market have functionality to push and pull keys. What advancements required from IED development from an IED development aspect? Um, I know there are several stack vendors actively working on getting this capability into their stack. Triangle Microworks is one of them. And I would uh, suspect that once this capability is embedded in the Triangle stack, the OEMs of that stack will get that capability and be able to put it into their products. Okay. Next question. I, I have one other thing. Mm -hmm. The market gets driven by utilities requesting this capability. So if you want it, request it of your vendors. Okay, next question. If a group security key is accessed in two systems simultaneously, what will be the result? I gotta honestly say I don't understand that question. Since it's a symmetric key, 
and keys are not shared between groups. Not sure how that would happen. And the encrypted channel for each group delivering the keys is different. So if they've got a clarification to the question, Beth, that would be great. Okay, so that in that question just got submitted. So if you wanna provide some additional information, we can go back to it. Um, the next one that just came in, can you provide an example use case for routable sample values? Routable sample values is really for synchrophasers. There've been, um, so uh, you can actually embed the synchronized measurement information into routable sample values and deliver them in a standardized and secure mechanism. The, there have been a lot of utilities that have, uh, whose IT staffs have raised the specter of how do you secure merging unit communications within a substation, which would be the layer two sample values. And this would allow you to authenticate those packets as well. Okay. Does this security cause a delay in either the Argoose or RSV messages? Um, well, Argoose and RSV have a requirement for a signature on them anyway. So of course, if you encrypt in the IED prior to publication, there is a delay. And I think Mark, you actually have some numbers, but it's it's in the hundreds to 500 of microsecond range, if you cool decide that. to encrypt. Correct. Now, having said that, RSV and Argoose have the ability to significantly expand the data set up to 64,000 bytes. So in encrypting of 64,000 bytes would add a much more significant delay. But on a normal goose message, maybe with you know 30 or 40 or 60, even 64 data items, authentication takes only about 500 microseconds end to end, as well as the encryption would take about the same amount of time. Now, I don't know if this kind of answered that question a little bit too, but how much time delay does authentication and encryption add to end-to-end -to -end delivery of Argus messages? One millisecond. Yeah. Or less. And that's from an implementation, by the way. Actual numbers. Okay. How and do I you think, send an I, 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 I think that's uh, also with more crypto cores coming out and new devices, that number is going to drop substantially, by the way. Sorry, Beth. It's, that number is okay. based on the calculations being done in a crypto core. Okay. Go ahead, Beth. Okay, next question. How do you send an IEEE C37.118 sample data directly into it? Uh, it's got to be mapped into 61850 data objects, and there's an IEEE standard uh, report. report on how to do that. Mark, do you know what the number is off the top of your head? It's a report, so it's, it does, it's not a standard, so it's not a C37 number. So there'll be a, T, a TR report in the IEEE world. And I, don't, I do not know what that is offhand. But the report is freely available. Okay, next question. Do you use Open SSL or Wolf SSL? No. <laughs> it's simple. Okay, next question. Um, are we able to see the data transfer timings? Of what? The key delivery or routable goose? If that question did, uh, goose, who just responded. Um, I 
Do you want to see it right now? I guess is the question. We aren't prepared to bring up Wireshark or the Goose Tracker in the lab right now to show that. I, I would point out that if a mess, assuming that there is GPS or synchronized timing between the two ends, uh, timing can be measured by looking at the transmission time versus the arrival time of the message, and you would get your 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 uh, latency calculation that way. Okay, I think that answered the question. He responded okay. Next question. In a wide area application with Argus, where should the KDC be located? In the control center or in one of the critical substations? Um, one of the future uh, capabilities of, the, of Garibaldi will be able to operate as part of a mesh network. So one of the uh, so you would be able to actually place it into the substation, and it would be able to um, manage keys and receive keys from other substations or a centralized site as needed. So it's a system design and deployment issue. It's not a technology issue. Okay, next question. Would RSV be a viable approach for line differential protection? And if yes, do you know of any deployments and where this is already up and running? So I'll, I'll take that on. And the answer is yes, it can be. But the point I, I would make is that now makes your differential protection dependent on GPS. There are other implementations that work today without requiring GPS. And so it really becomes a philosophy question as to whether or not you want to have your differential dependent upon GPS. Okay, next question. Can mobile networks 4G connections be used as connection to public IP networks in Argus and RSV schemes? I don't see why not, Herb. I don't either. It needs to support UDP multicast. That's the requirement. Right, in theory it should all work, but we have yeah. seen some issues with, with some routers on the market. You know, for GSI, some Ethernet routers have um, some implementation issues, so it should be tested, but it should work. Yeah, we've Maybe. actually seen some problems with some firewalls with it too. So. That's what I'm saying also, firewall issues. And the the routers out there need to support the protocol independent multicast, PIM. Yep. But the media itself should be able to support it. Okay. Next question. Do you need redundant KDC centers for reliability? That's a question of utility policy. Um, if you can bring up a KDC within 24 hours of failure, depending upon your key rotation time, probably not. I would suggest it though. I would also point out that many utilities might have a re an availability requirement on the order of five nines. In order to meet that, you would have to have redundant KDCs. Yep. Okay, next question. Is the key delivery method standardized or is it proprietary to Garibaldi? It's standardized. Internationally. Yep. Okay. Next question. Doesn't KDC introduce a single point of failure for IED communication in the network? Not if you deploy redundant nodes. And yeah, that's based on the previous question. Yep. Okay. 
one of the reasons KDA was developed was to was to address those issues. Okay, next question. If goose must be transferred at a maximum of four milliseconds, securing it would make it slower. What is your advice to make it secure and allowable for our goose and RSV? I think the four millisecond requirement is for layer two. I'm not sure uh, that the transmission latency as the three or four milliseconds actually applies would be impacted there. If you send more bytes, as Mark pointed out, it could be. You've also got that. That's also the protection class for yep. goose, which probably isn't appropriate for our goose. But our, our goose still meets that protection, can, can meet that protection class if, it's, if the message is not terribly large. And yep. you can constrain the network. Yes. If you're sending it over the the open internet, for example, worst case, you, you can't you can't prove that. This is true. I I, I did it on a back to back network, but back right. to back, it's 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 on the order of two milliseconds. Right. I'm just saying, I'm just pointing out there's some variability in the network that that comes into play there. Okay. Next question. Are there any plans to integrate KDC with cloud services, allowing Garibaldi to run on Azure or AWS, for example, rather than requiring a server computer in a control center or substation? Um, it should be capable of running in a Azure cloud as is. We just haven't tested it there. My next question, does Garibaldi support layer two Goose SV security as well as it only R Goose RSV? Um, uh, the, those switches, if, and if you say to include layer two Goose and layer two SV, Garibaldi will manage the keys for those streams as well. Okay, well, I think that wraps up all our questions. Um, there were some early on that I believe did get answered online, but as I mentioned before, we will go through all the questions, provide answers, um, and send that out as part of the follow-up. Um, so you have all the questions and answers that were asked throughout the webinar today. Um, so again, I just would like to thank everyone for joining us today and, and hanging on for an extra 20 minutes to go through all the questions and answers. We certainly appreciate your time. Hopefully you got a lot out of this and we uh, hope to see you on our next webinar in August. So with that, thanks everyone and take care. Thanks.